Joining me now is documentary filmmaker Michael Moore. Brother Moore, welcome to the show. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. I, I, it's, uh, it's kind of rough watching the videotape of that mother. Um, oh, my God. And it just, you know, I wanted to say something, too, about the John Lennon, um, Yoko, um, sending out that incredible statistic that over a million people have been killed by guns in this country since John Lennon was killed. And I remember thinking a few years after that, uh, George Harrison, I know if you remember, was, was also attacked in his home. Right. He was asleep right. in, in his bed. Uh, the, but the intruder had a knife um, because it's really hard to get a hold of a gun in Great Britain. And um, they were able to wrestle the guy out of the bed, and George's wife bopped him with a lamp. And, um, and, I, and I remember thinking that night that the only reason that George Harrison is alive tonight and John Lennon is dead is because John Lennon chose to live in the United States of America. Wow. He wanted, yeah. he wanted to be one of us. He wanted to be an American. And, and this happens not only to him, as Yoko points out, but to so many others. Murder, suicide, accidental guns going off. Just, it's, it's, um, I want to, can, can I just say something else, too? I, Absolutely. I, I know we don't have, we don't, there's That's no right. agenda here. Um, and it's the first time I've been able to talk to you on, on TV like this, so it's very, I'm really honored to be able to do that. Um, Thank you, my friend. I want to, I want to I clear this up about how I really feel about uh, gun control laws. Um, I don't believe that the gun control laws that we want to pass, and I want them passed, and I am fighting very hard uh, for them, um, that's not really going to change the problem. And uh, nobody on our side really, I think, wants to say that sometimes because we want to, well, yes, no, no, it'll, it'll all go away. Well, you know, it really all won't go away because, um, I, you know, if, in my movie, Bowling for Columbine, which the, the, the right wing attacks and the NRA attacks and I'm on their enemies list, they've never seen the movie. Because if they'd seen the movie, the point I made in the film was uh, that I actually kind of agree with the NRA that guns don't kill people, except I changed their slogan to guns don't kill people, Americans kill people. Mm. We're the ones who do this. Those Canadian, right. those Canadian kids tonight, on a Friday night, living up there in Toronto or Vancouver, Sudbury, they, they are playing the same violent video games that are played in this country. Mm -hmm. It's not any of the stuff that we are talking about. There is something wrong with the American character. And that, until we ultimately get to that, as to why we believe as a society and officially as a government that violence is a means to an end, that violence is okay to solve our problems. If we think somebody might have some weapons of mass destruction, it's okay to go and invade their country and kill hundreds of thousands of civilians. If, we, if someone has committed a crime, we're one of the few countries left, that, I think it's uh, uh, North Korea, uh, 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 Saudi Arabia, Iran, that still have the death penalty. One of the few countries that we believe it's okay to kill a human being who's committed a crime. We believe, societal-wise and, and, and our gender-wise, that um, it's okay to strike a woman. A woman is hit, is physically abused every 15 seconds in this country. That's right. where we live, Michael. And, I, you, know, as, you know, as I said in my, in my last movie, you know, I refuse to live in a country like this, and I'm not leaving. So, right. but, so if I'm not leaving, Something's got to change. And well, let me ask you. Yeah, let me ask I'm you sorry. this. That, that, no, no, no. It, it's very powerful. Uh, obviously, the obsession with violence has marked America in a way that it does not characterize other societies in terms of the impact, the consequence. And the, dif the, dif the difference is that they, we have guns, and we have ready access to guns, and those guns flood our society, and those guns have big magazines and big drums and big clips, and we are able to repeatedly uh, shoot a, a bullet into a person and kill them and kill masses of people, whereas in Britain, uh, as you talked about with um, George Harrison, uh, a knife attack was far less likely to, to result in murder. So what is it about America? You talk about the character of America, but what is it about us that makes us so dogged and insistent on having access to guns as the Second Amendment, worshiping it? We act like it's the Second Commandment, not the Second Amendment. So what is it about us that makes us so obsessed with that that we're willing to see this as the necessary sacrifice, the loss of millions of lives as the necessary sacrifice to possess those guns? Fear. Fear and racism. 
That's what distinguishes us from these other countries. Because make no mistake about it, uh, Germany and Japan, I would say, they, they in the past have had a culture of violence and um, have been into murdering a lot of people and using violence as a means. We're not the only one in history who has done that. All right, there's right. a lot of, you know, uh, the Norwegians, which is probably one of the more peaceful countries, which had a very sad massacre uh, last mm -hmm. year. But, uh, you know, they're the descendants of the Vikings. So um, it's not just that. The thing that's different with us is that our powers that be, our, our, our corporate chieftains, our politicians, have for years figured out the American psyche, that we are just, we are an afraid people, and we've been afraid for a long time. We were afraid of the native people when we landed here, so what did we have to do? Get rid of them. You know, we were, we were afraid of, of slave uprisings and rebellions, so we had to make sure that they ca had no, anywhere near any access to weapons or whatever. Mm -hmm. On and on and on through our history, this, this fear right. and this manipulation. You turn on the 11 o'clock news tonight, on any local station, I'm telling you, the first three stories anywhere in the country is going to be, tonight, a drive-by shooting in Brooklyn. You know, tonight. <laughs> it's like, it's right. like, oh, my God. The, oh, my God. And this is what you're supposed to sit there at home and just be just, um, I can't say it uh, on um, uh, right, right. Gotcha. Uh, free cable. Gotcha. But you know what I'm saying? We're, right. we're supposed to be scared out of our minds. And, and, and here's the interesting statistic. Uh, when, I, when my movie came out, I would ask uh, groups... I said, you, do you realize that over 90% of the guns in this country are owned by white people in the suburbs and in rural areas? 90% of our guns are not owned by African Americans, Hispanics, minority groups. They're owned by white people. Now, what are these white people so afraid of out in the suburbs? Are they thinking little redhead, freckle-faced Jimmy down the street is going to, you know, kill them, mug them? I don't think so. Are they afraid the guy next door is going to is going to break in and steal their their TV? No, because they know the guy next door uh, makes fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. So poverty and racism. You know, most of our gun shootings are, are essentially coming from two groups: the 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 poor, the the, the sort of the, the official uh, uh, group of poor people that we will not right. ever change. It seems. Um, uh, you know, find so much violence in their neighborhoods, and then people who are just insane. Now, history, we've always had insane people. But as you just said, so if you've got the, for the insane people, you want to make it as hard for them as possible to get their hand on a gun, or if they get a gun, to fire as few bullets as possible. For right. the group that we never talk about in these, we have these big shows after the school shootings and whatever, but actually most of the violence, the people that are dying are African Americans and Hispanics and poor people. Um, that if we ever address that problem, if we ever made it so that Chicago or East L.A. or, or Detroit were places that were thriving and, and where we had jobs and people were paid a middle-class wage, what's the chance of you walking home tonight in your middle-class neighborhood and, and being shot by somebody with a handgun? Very, right. very small. So given that, given the fact that you've talked about this, Professor David Cole, my colleague at uh, Georgetown Law School, speaks about this as well, eloquently as you have done here, that when black and Latino kids die, it's a, it, we're willing to accept that as the necessary price we pay for access to these guns. But when it begins to bleed out into suburban America and where white kids begin to be victimized by this vicious culture of resentment and retaliation and this brewing subculture of disaffection and alienation from America expressed in, a, in many ways and from traditional culture, so how do we come to grips with that? We, we allow it to happen in the ghetto, but we don't want it to happen in the suburb, but now we can't quarantine it anymore. What's the answer? Answer to the problem we confront together now? Uh, the answer is like, it's pretty much the same answer for a lot of our other problems, jobs. Jobs. You know, in, in, in countries like Canada or France or Great Britain, they have a, so, a social safety net. Uh, it's, it's not that they don't have unemployment, they do. But they, they know it's in their best interest not to let people fall between the cracks because then that makes everybody less safe. So really, actually, for selfish reasons, they have a social safety net that catches people, that, that uh, looks to train them, uh, provide jobs, the government provides jobs. Uh, they do any of a number of things. And that's why, if, if you've ever traveled to Canada, mm -hmm. um, if you've walked down the street at midnight in Toronto, let me tell you, you don't feel the same way that what well, you right. do walking down the street in downtown Detroit. And why is that? Because the Canadians are just human beings. They're no better than you or I. So why is right. that? And why do they get to do that? What is it about them? And what can we learn from them? Right. 
Well, when we talk about learning something from them, obviously you believe that nothing has changed in the 10 years since you've made Bowling for Columbine. You faced the culture then, you faced tremendous opposition. You were, you were assaulted, you were attacked. People called you out of your name, everything but a child of God. Um, you, the, the vituperation of the right wing was uh, evident and some of the resistance from liberals who didn't understand why you were so direct about it. Do you think looking back you were prophetic and that your movie is just as relevant today as it was 10 years ago? Uh, Maybe. Well, no, right. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this because I think mm -hmm. pro on a personal level, I feel like I failed. I made that mm -hmm. movie to try and stop uh, this madness after Columbine. And, um, and, you know, I probably like all filmmakers or documentary filmmakers, we think that, you know, the world will change. And so I just, I... Um, the fact that it is as relevant, the fact that, I mean, people say to me, hey, Mike, why don't you do a sequel now to Bowling for Combat? I'm going, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. The, the right. movie's the same movie. It's the same movie I'd make today. It, it's, uh, right. it's, uh, it saddens me, but, uh, but I'll tell you, I'm not paralyzed by it. I'm as, as pissed off as ever, and I am willing to join with the majority of my fellow Americans, the 303 million of us who are not members of the National Rifle Association. We're the majority. We're the majority that want these laws passed, and we're the majority that want us to stop invading other countries, and we're the majority that do not like it when violence against women act are held up for years. That's us. Me, right. you, the people watching, we're the majority. And it's time right. that the minority, the right wing of this country, you've had your time, you've had your day, you haven't made us a better country. We're far worse off than when I was a child. So step aside. We're here now, and we're going to figure this out. And please, our leaders that we've elected, President Obama, Harry Reid, and the others, buck up, man. Buck up and All right. do your job. Do All your right. job. You're That's, representing uh, us. <laughs> That's from paralysis to being PO'd, the paradigmatic shift <laughs> expressed here tonight by Michael Moore. Stay with us, Mr. Moore. We're going to continue this conversation. Want me to stay? <laughs> I want you to stay, my friend. This is great. We'll also talk about the Iraqi war when we come back. On March 